Joyce Craig, uh, former mayor of Manchester, who is running for governor in the, uh, at the moment in the Democratic primary, um, is joining us. Um, so, Joyce, I, I guess the the basic question um, in a primary race is you and your primary opponent have a lot of similar uh, positions on some of the major issues facing the state. Uh, why should voters choose you? So first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to meet with you and speak with you. Uh, so uh, it's a very good question and comes up a lot. Uh, I have the executive experience. Uh, for the last six years, I served as the chief executive for the city of Manchester. And I know that local government is different throughout our state. In Manchester, we don't have a city manager. So it was my job to develop the annual budget of $400 million every year. I nominated city department heads and city commissioners, negotiated contracts, managed all of the city departments, and was chairman of both the Board of School Committee and the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. I've also gone through very difficult elections. Uh, so when I became mayor in 2017, I beat a popular four-term incumbent Republican. And I was the first Democratic mayor elected in Manchester since 2003. Uh, Manchester is a tough place to win for Democrats, and I've won here multiple times. Uh, so that's a significant difference as well. And, you know, I stand behind my full record. I have always taken on the tough fights, many times statewide challenges, and delivered results for residents. Okay. Um, so for decades, the first question usually asked um, uh, of anybody running for governor uh, has been, uh, will you take the pledge? And, and that may not be as, as, as important a question um, uh, as it used to be, but a governor's approach to taxes and revenues um, certainly is a big deal. What's your take on the state's tax structure? Is there other things you would change? So I first want to be very clear. I do not support a sales or an income tax and would veto anything that came to my desk. Um, you know, what we've seen over the years is Republicans really dismantling a lot of the revenue sources that we have coming into our state. And so we need to make sure that we are addressing that. Um, as I mentioned, I have experienced developing budgets uh, in very challenging times as well. Uh, and uh, I've always done it by prioritizing what's most important to residents in our communities. And that's the same approach that I would take to developing a budget as governor. Uh, my priorities would be funding public education, making sure we're funding public safety, as well as affordable housing. Uh, when it comes to revenues, uh, you know, I am supportive of legalization of cannabis. I think it's far time that the state do that uh, properly regulated and taxed uh, as all of our neighbors have done that. Uh, and that will provide a significant revenue uh, coming into our state that I would suggest we put toward public schools and affordable housing. You know, I think it's wrong um, that millionaire, millionaires are getting a massive tax break right now while the costs are coming onto the backs of our hardworking families. Uh, you know, that's taking $160 million a year away. Uh, they're, they're, it's giveaways for the most wealthy in our state, like Kelly Ayotte, um, and, and that has to change. As mayor, um, developing a budget for local communities, I understand the impact as well of downshifting from our state how that plays into the increase on our local taxpayers. And so the downshifting of uh, education costs, the downshifting of retirement costs that the state should be funding, uh, that needs to stop. Uh, and I will look at um, making sure we are adequately funding those things as governor. I'll mention one other thing, uh, having um, been chairman of the school board. One of the biggest cost drivers that districts are seeing across our state right now is for special education. And our federal government has not been funding uh, to the percentage that they're supposed to, the costs for uh, special education. And that's something, again, that I would fight for to make sure we're getting that here in the state. 
And lastly, as mayor, I have significant experience going after federal grants. So uh, my office led an effort to apply for a very competitive federal grant. Uh, we were the only municipality to win for the biomanufacturing industry. We have $40 million coming in for workforce development. It's creating 7,000 new jobs. We also got a $24 million infrastructure grant and another $20 million grant for a transportation hub. And I think that's something that as governor, we need to be aggressive going after those federal grants, but also work with our local communities, cities and towns to provide the, um, the expertise or the support that they need uh, to also apply for those. Okay, you mentioned education funding as a as one aspect of uh, the state's uh, obligation. So uh, New Hampshire is again fighting off lawsuits um, based on the inequity and inadequacy of its education funding um, system. As as governor, how would you propose we get past that? Yeah, so as mayor, I signed on to the Conval lawsuit. Um, and I'll start by saying I first got involved in public service when I ran for school board. Uh, you know, at the time I had three young children and really wanted to change the direction of Manchester Public Schools. And it really is still what drives me today because I know that quality public education leads to thriving communities and creates opportunities for our kids and their futures. And so this there, as, t as you mentioned, there have been a number of lawsuits that have said that our state is not adequately funding public education. And as governor, that will be my priority to fund public education. Right now, we have a voucher program that is taking millions of dollars away from our public schools at a time when uh, the current administration is also spending money uh, to fight uh, funding our public education. Uh, you know, I believe that any child in this state, no matter where they live, should have access to quality public schools. And that's something that I will fight to ensure happens as governor. Okay, uh, so on the, the topic of uh, education vouchers, um, you know, proponents of school choice argue that every student should have the same opportunity to be educated in a setting that best fits them. And then they say, well, so uh, public education money meant for that student should follow them to private, even religious schools. Um, I, so I guess in two parts, one, if, a, if public schools are not satisfying the needs of uh, students whose families aren't wealthy enough to just go pick a private school to send them to, what should the state be doing to, to ensure those kids get what they need? And then I guess, secondly, um, how would you approach um, the, the uh, education freedom account system? Yeah, governor? so, so, I believe that we need to fund public education adequately. That is not happening right now. And when we do, and when we have an education commissioner who understands and believes in public education, then we should have uh, quality public education no matter where you know a family lives in that state. But what we have right now is an education commissioner who is doing everything in his power to dismantle public education in a state that is taking funds away from our public schools and putting it toward a voucher program. Again, I feel strongly and believe that we need to build up our public schools to meet the needs of students no matter where they live. And that will be my priority. It is funding public education, not funding a voucher program. And for students who don't seem to to be served well by their local public schools? Yeah, so I think that, again, when we fund our public education, provide training for our teachers, ensure we have uh, curriculum that meets their needs, uh, when we have class sizes uh, that are, are meet the requirements in our state, uh, and an education commissioner who believes 
in quality public schools and this state funds education, public education where it should be, I believe that our public schools will meet the needs of students throughout our state. Okay, I, I wanna I wanna just ask one more on the topic of education, um, particularly uh, given your your background as a school board member. Um, uh, so, uh, how do we balance um, parental rights? Um, with letting teachers and schools do their jobs unimpeded? Would you look to roll back measures that have been passed during the, the, the last few years, um, like the decisive concepts law or others? Uh, yes, I have spoken out against those. Um, so uh, a couple things, as I mentioned, I am a parent of three children. They're now 27, 25 and 20, but they all went through the Manchester Public Schools. And now my middle daughter is a teacher. Uh, she actually went back to school today for her third year. She's teaching uh, English as a second language students uh, who are in seventh grade here in the city of Manchester. But as a parent with kids in uh, public schools, um, you know, I, I did run into issues. Uh, but when I did, I was able to connect with teachers, uh, whether it was via email or a phone call or a meeting. And uh, the teachers were accommodating, uh, as was, you know, the administration. And so there has to be, um, you know, we have to make sure uh, that parents are engaged and involved. Um, and that there is ongoing communication between our educators and our schools. Uh, and, you know, from my perspective, that is happening today and it's working. Uh, we should not be um, putting up obstacles for our educators. Uh, we need to be encouraging the work that they're doing uh, because today our teachers uh, have uh, you know, it is it is tough being an educator in today today's environment. Um, our teachers aren't just teaching; uh, they are providing love, they're providing clothing, they're providing meals, they're providing mental health counseling, and we need to support our educators uh, so that they can provide what our students need uh, in our state: uh, a safe uh, learning environment. Trying to pivot to abortion. Um, Joyce, as governor, how would you affect change to the state's abortion law? Uh, so I first want to say that I trust women to make their own health care decisions. Um, and as governor, I will fight to ensure it stays that, that way. Uh, you know, I, I think about the Dobbs decision and the fact that New Hampshire is the only state in New England that hasn't codified access to abortion. And I think about my two daughters and our daughters and granddaughters and the fact that they have less control over their bodies than we did at their age, and that's wrong. As governor, I will ensure that we codify access to abortion uh, and protect reproductive health care but also that we expand reproductive freedom. So I'm the only candidate in this race that has put forward a policy plan that both uh, talks to how we will uh, protect and expand reproductive health care in New Hampshire. Um, I guess we have to talk about funding then too. How would you get funding for reproductive health care through what will likely be a GOP dominated executive council? Yeah, you know, it's something that I will um, make sure that I do everything in my power to fund our local reproductive health care centers. Uh, it's not enough to say as governor, this is something we should do. This is something we need to sit around the table and have a serious conversation uh, with elected officials on because right now, we are not um, the state, the executive council has voted against this funding. Uh, and this funding is going toward reproductive health care, cancer screenings, uh, basic needs uh, for people who need it the most. And so, you know, in my experience as mayor, uh, I had to work through my board of mayor and aldermen for everything that I got done in the city of Manchester. And trust me, it wasn't always easy. And we had to take a lot of time up front communicating the pros and cons and how it would affect individuals within our community. And I would take that same approach in this instance. Uh, we have to find common ground. And my hope is that whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, they will support providing 
quality health care to residents within our state. Sticking with that health care theme, um, as you know, many areas of this state have a real lack of medical care options, and our part of the state is no different. So what can be done to attract more providers? Yeah, so this is something that I am hearing as I travel across the state. And actually, just yesterday, I was with the Manadinoc, um Collaborative, and they specifically mentioned uh, that there are hundreds of healthcare open positions uh, within your communities. Um, and so we do know <laughs> one of the biggest uh, areas and uh, obstacles to bringing more workforce into our state is the lack of housing. And so we need to make sure we are addressing the housing crisis in our state, uh, which I'm assuming we're gonna talk about um, as well. Um, and then, you know, we need to think about offering incentives uh, to bring people here, uh, whether it's uh, loan forgiveness programs uh, or other initiatives, uh, other uh, incentives. And, um, you know, we, we talked about uh, reproductive health care and access to abortion earlier. And we have to think about the laws that are in place, uh, because right now our abortion ban actually, you know, um, bans, uh, criminalizes doctors in our state. Uh, and something like that is keeping healthcare providers from coming to New Hampshire. And so that's one of the reasons why we have to change this as well. So what about this trend of um, large hospital groups or healthcare providers um, controlling more of the state's medical options? So it, that, you know, that is a concern. Uh, we need to make sure that everything that we are doing, uh, we are providing the quality health care that our residents need, especially in your area. Uh, you mentioned the access to health care, which is something that I'm hearing as well. Uh, and something that I've learned uh, on the trail is that uh, one of the successes uh, that's happening in your area is the outreach to people going to their homes. Um, and that's something that we implemented in Manchester as well with community health workers. Uh, but what we need to do is make sure that, again, with everything that's going on in our state, we take a common sense approach to it and always ensure that the access to quality, affordable health care is there. Um, New Hampshire providers consistently decry the state's Medicaid reimbursement rates. How would you seek to raise them? So uh, we do need to take a look at Medicaid rates here in the state. And I'm grateful for the work that was done last session uh, in, in that arena. Uh, but again, in my conversations with uh, with doctors and with uh, mental health care providers, it's very clear that they are providing health care and they are not being reimbursed at an adequate rate. Um, and if that continues, we run the risk of uh, closures. And if that happens, then we will not have uh, the health care services that our community members need. And so we need to prioritize this uh, from you know a Medicare perspective, uh, continue to work with our federal de delegation uh, to make sure that they are funding rates as they should. And from a budgeting perspective, make sure that we are uh, providing uh, adequate Medicaid rates uh, so that entities can continue to provide the essential services that residents in New Hampshire need. I'd like to ask about the opioid crisis. You know, it seemed we were making progress pre-pandemic and then, you know, it seemed to get worse. So um, how do you think we get back on track in New Hampshire? Yeah, um, the, you know, as mayor, uh, the opioid crisis is something that, you know, we tackled on a daily basis. And in working with mayors across our state, uh, Democrats, independents, and Republicans, you know, uh, this is something that uh, we all worked together on. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a challenge uh, that we face in New Hampshire and throughout our, our country. But coming from the local level, uh, we've been able to do an awful lot. 
uh, we implemented uh, evidence-based programs to help people get the services that they need. Uh, I hired a director of overdose prevention here in the city of Manchester. Uh, we put forward the city's first harm reduction strategy uh, that could be adopted statewide. Uh, but one of the things that you know I know as uh, a local leader is the impact that the state has on our local communities with funding that comes into our cities and towns. Uh, and I'll use the doorway as an example. The state funds the doorway uh, program throughout our state. Uh, that doorway program is, is uh, supposed to be a place where anyone suffering from mental health issues, substance use disorder, or homelessness can go to get the services they need. So <laughs> The doorway is open nine to five, Monday through Friday, not necessarily when someone goes into crisis. I can tell you that in Manchester, our doorway program is located next to probation and parole, and people, many people don't go because of that. And it's something that I have been telling the state for years, but the executive council continues to sign the same contract. And part of that doorway program is that it pays for uh, an individual to go to a sober home for one month. But evidence shows that an individual should be in a sober home for five to six months in order to get on that path to recovery. So what we are seeing is a revolving door of people going into a sober home for a month, not being able to afford to stay there, going back onto the streets, unfortunately um, using drugs again, and then going through this process. It's not an effective or efficient use of our state dollars, and it is not serving our uh, most vulnerable in our state. So as governor, I'm going to take a really close look, critical look at the funds that are going into our local communities and work with our cities and towns to make sure that the funds that are going in meet are meeting the needs of uh, individuals who need our help. So those are, are you mentioned the, the the doorway not being open uh, long enough each day and uh, and each week and the uh, recovery uh, payments not being nearly long for nearly a long enough period of time. Those are both pretty uh, probably pretty expensive things. So when you say you'd look at the funding, you, you, would you be committing to to raising a lot more the funding by quite a bit to to fund those things so i think what what the, what i said well what i said was that we're seeing a revolving door of people going in and out mm -hmm. so to me that's not an effective use of dollars so from that i think that we will be able to say uh we have the funds to do what we need to do within our community with the dollars we have, we just need to allocate it in a way that is most effective and efficient to help the people that are in need. Okay, and and you mentioned, um, you know, obviously mental health is a big part of uh, of the opioid uh, crisis, and it, and it is something that the state deals with as well. Um, what are your thoughts on on getting to the point where the state does not have a waiting list and is not having to house the mentally ill in hospital ERs. We have to get there. Right now, the state is has been sued and is spending money, you know, against a lawsuit instead of spending funds on making sure we are providing the necessary services to residents in our state from a mental health perspective. People should not be boarded in a, in a hospital. Uh, we should have beds in our hospital. Uh, it, we should have adequate beds throughout our state to serve individuals who are in need. And we have to start thinking early on on prevention and providing services early on to families and to children. You know, in Manchester, we have um, we have two schools that are piloting with healthcare and mental health services in the school, uh, providing services early on uh, in hopes to prevent this need, this crisis that we're in in our state. And we need to learn from uh, these programs that we're piloting uh, and, and make sure that we're implementing those that are working uh, throughout New Hampshire. But again, this is a crisis 
uh, that the state is in uh, because we haven't planned and we haven't implemented what's needed in New Hampshire. Uh, and we've got to get this done. So you mentioned um, affordable housing earlier, and I think Rick's going to ask you about that. That's one of the major concerns in this state, but also child care. And I'd like to ask about that. How do we lower child care costs and still pay child care workers the wage they deserve? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great question. And again, something I'm hearing as I travel across the state, I would say there's nothing more important uh, than, you know, public education, early childhood education, and affordable and quality child care for residents across our state. And to your question, it's this, it's this catch 22, because we know we have to pay our child care workers uh, a livable wage. Uh, and what we have to make sure we're doing is that we're not, um, passing the cost on to families. Uh, and unless we have workers in our childcare centers, we won't have the slots, you know, for families who need them. And so, you know, we, we are one of the only states that hasn't uh, brought forward early uh, pre-K. And I feel strongly that we need to do that. Uh, again, it's really important. Uh, expand uh, early Head Start programs. Look at uh, loan forgiveness programs for uh, individuals who are interested in going into childcare. Uh, and, you know, as I travel around the state and I look at the schools, I think back to, you know, when when I was in high school or even just a few years ago, but our tech schools actually had um, programming uh, for our students who were interested in childcare. That doesn't exist anymore. And knowing that, you know, what is going on right now, I feel strongly that we need to bring that back so we can fill this need. Uh, and Minimum wage uh, is, I think, plays into this too. Uh, our early child care workers uh, are, are not making enough money and uh, we need to look at the minimum wage in the state. In Manchester, uh, we had an issue uh, on the city side and on the school district side of people applying for entry level jobs. Uh, and uh, so we took action and we increased the minimum wage uh, for city workers and for school district workers to $15 an hour. And what we saw after that is that there was an increase in applications for these jobs. And uh, it's important to take that learning uh, to the state house and make sure that we have, you know, a better minimum wage than what we currently have right now. Thank you. Could you explain your plan for creating affordable housing? Sure. Uh, I just uh, put out a plan uh, yesterday on affordable housing. Uh, it is critical that we start working right now. Uh, the statewide projections in New Hampshire are that we need 60,000 housing units by 2030. As mayor, I did take action on this. And today we have over 2,000 housing units in development in Manchester. I allocated over $30 million uh, to affordable housing initiatives. And uh, we broke ground on one of the largest affordable housing developments in the state this past December. And so I, I do have the hands-on experience of negotiating with developers, allocating funds to incentivize affordable housing and working with local communities to meet your housing needs, which I think is really important. Um, our plan goes through a number of things, but you know, a couple of them. One is supporting our local communities. There are many small towns uh, that don't have uh, the technical expertise to look at uh, potential changes in zoning to encourage more affordable housing in their communities. And I feel strongly that our state needs to be partnering with our cities and towns to get that done. Um, having gone through the projects that I have here in the city of Manchester, I understand how um, complex putting all of the funding pieces together is. Um, on average, I think it's about 13 different funding pieces that a developer needs to put together to get a project off the ground. Uh, New Hampshire Finance, Finance Authority plays a major role um, in affordable housing. And I would suggest that we increase uh, the funding for uh, New Hampshire Finance Authority so that we can get more of these projects off the ground. 
and look at um, you know, making sure that we are funding first-time home buying programs. Um, again, uh, 79E opportunities uh, with keeping tax rates um, at a at a set rate before the significant investment goes in. Uh, look at um, allowing local communities to access that for their entire town or city, or when a commercial property is uh, changing to uh, residential. Um, density bonuses are another example for affordable housing. But again, it gets down to working with our local communities. Uh, right now, that's really not happening. And I think it's critical uh, from both uh, providing funding opportunities, from providing technical expertise, and talking about why it's so important uh, that, we can, that we build now um, so that our young people and our seniors and our hardworking families can afford to live here. Because if we don't have the housing, we're not going to be able to attract the workforce uh, that we talked about earlier or encourage our young people to stay here, uh, which, is, which is absolutely critical as well. Uh, technical assistance and incentives are one thing, but there are many municipalities throughout the state that have exclusionary zoning practices and local boards that aren't necessarily friendly to development. What statewide uh, requirements should be changed? Should some of these uh, changes be mandated from a state level? You know, I would first look to work with our local communities uh, to make sure that we are doing everything that we can uh, for that local community uh, to build the housing uh, that meets their needs. And the hope is that when we provide support, when we prove that we are partnering in this and we can prove the value to their local community that additional housing will bring, then we'll be able to make sure that we're moving forward on the housing that we need. In the meantime, what steps should the state take in dealing with homelessness? So um, this is something that has affected our country and our entire state. Uh, back in 2020, uh, when I was mayor, I worked with all of the mayors, uh, Democrats, independents, and Republicans. The number one issue that we all said we were facing at that time was homelessness. All of the mayors just met, met a few months ago, uh, and the number one issue they said that they were still facing was homelessness and housing. So the state needs to help our local communities in working to address homelessness in our cities and towns. In Manchester, we made tremendous progress. Uh, you know, some examples include uh, we opened up the first city-run, city-funded shelter during the winter for fatality prevention. And I will say that that shelter is still open today and it's full. I hired an expert, a uh, director of housing initiatives uh, to come in and really move forward our continuum of care and work with all of our partners, including the state to make sure we were getting the resources that we needed. Um, I got the National Alliance to End Homelessness to come into the city of Manchester. Their mission is to prevent and end homelessness across this entire country. I got private funding for this, so tax, no taxpayer dollars. They're working with the city of Manchester to ensure that our programs are best meeting the needs of the most vulnerable. And I feel strongly that this is something that we should be doing from the state level so that we're helping all individuals who are without a home uh, to, to make sure we're serving our local communities. We opened up an engagement center where individuals can go in, uh, get a meal, take a shower, and our nonprofits are under one roof so they can directly be connected to the services that they need. I have been dealing with this as mayor of Manchester, and as a result of the work that we've done, uh, we decreased encampments by 60%. But there's a lot more work that we need to do, both uh, in our city and in cities and towns across our state. And I think it's really important to have a governor who has worked in this realm and understands the challenges at the local level. One of the things that I am proposing is that, you know, we move forward with a housing first model. We have pockets of that throughout our state. But right now, what we see is that our shelters are pretty much full. 
people are staying in their shell in the shelters for far too long. And we need to the next step in the continuum of care, which is uh, supportive housing so that we can wrap an individual with the services they need, stabilize them, and then they can be on a path uh, to being better. Uh, and so those are those are some of the things that I would look to do. I'm turning to cannabis. Uh, this year, the legislature came close to legalizing marijuana under a plan dictated by the governor that would put almost all control in the hands of the state. Um, what model do you prefer and what concerns do you have about public health, given that this would certainly lead to uh, legalization of a new intoxicant and, and more widespread use? So I do support legalization of cannabis. I think it is far time for our state, given that all of our surrounding uh, states have legalized this, uh, properly regulated and properly taxed. As I mentioned earlier, this would bring a significant uh, amount of revenues into our state that we could put toward uh, uh, education and prevention programs, uh, public education, and affordable housing. And from a model perspective, I am supportive of a uh, a model that will benefit New Hampshire residents. So a small business entrepreneurial model uh, with local control, and that also benefits our local farmers. And any any concerns about uh, public health by introducing a new legalized intoxicant and perhaps more children having access to it? Well, I think, you know, as I mentioned, when we legalize it, it has to be properly regulated. And part of that also has to be a significant educational component uh, to our communities within our schools and working with our public health administrators to make sure the information is getting out, just like any other, uh, you know, cigarettes and alcohol uh, and making sure that people understand what is happening within our communities and the dangers of that. I think your website lists a more detailed policy on energy than than many other areas. What's the big step New Hampshire can take right away? Uh, so, you know, as mayor of Manchester, I took climate change and rising energy costs seriously. Uh, we built the largest solar array in the state and uh, saved our fam our family's money and uh, because of that solar array and other initiatives we put in place, we were able to cut carbon emissions in Manchester by 60%. So I feel strongly with leadership who understands this, we can really make some significant progress in our local communities. Um, one, you know, I guess to just talk about one thing, but, you know, um, there are a number of things, but uh, not having a table, uh, not having a seat at the table right now with offshore wind, I think is a huge miss for the state of New Hampshire. And so that's one of the things that I would start initiate right away. We need to have a seat at that table. Uh, there's a significant opportunity for renewable energy there, but also for jobs and manufacturing to be brought into our state, which is you know, absolutely critical. Um, my plan, as you mentioned, focuses on uh, decreasing costs for our residents for our and our businesses, uh, increasing our energy supply, and making sure we are doing everything in our power to protect and preserve this beautiful state that we live in for generations to come. Um, turning to public education, uh, uh, higher education, we have among the highest student debt in the nation and the lowest state contribution to higher ed. Uh, what would you do differently and how do you bring the dollars to bear on, on this and and really uh, public education and in, in, in K through 12 under this on the present revenue model in the state? Yeah. Uh, so I I am a proud graduate of the University of New Hampshire in Durham, as is my husband and my middle daughter. Uh, and I will say that my youngest daughter is now in school in Boston uh, because she got a better merit scholarship from that college uh, than she did uh, from New Hampshire. Uh, so that's why she's out of state. And my concern, uh, like many parents in our state, is that she is now going to build relationships and have internships in Massachusetts uh, and not come back. 
And so we need to do everything that we can to adequately fund our higher education system. You know, at one point in our state's history, the university system was funded at a certain level. And while I know that it was increased last session, it wasn't enough. And so we need to look at the, the impact of not funding the cost and the impact of not funding the university system. Because I can tell you that people are not going to school here because they can go to school somewhere else uh, for, for less money and not have the college debt as you, the significant college debt, as you mentioned. And um, the loss for our state is significant when we can't attract and retain young people and bring them here and keep them here to fill the jobs uh, that we need filled. I'll mention a program that I uh, implemented as mayor. It was called the Manchester Promise Program. I put $3 million aside uh, of ARPA dollars. Uh, we knew that uh, we had students who were graduating from Manchester public schools uh, that could have gone to college but didn't because they couldn't afford it or they, were, they needed to stay home to support their families. And so I partnered with uh, Southern New Hampshire University and with Manchester Community College, and we provided debt-free college for, for a cohort of 60 students. Um, these 60 students are now in their junior year. They're all performing better than traditional college students. They're staying local. They're actually giving back to the community and they're majoring in uh, industries uh, and job uh, opportunities that we need. Uh, teachers, uh, aviation, uh, tech, biomanufacturing. And so it just goes to show that when we provide funding uh, or adequately fund uh, education, the benefits of keeping these young people here are real. But, but where do you <laughs> find... Yeah, to your question, it's yep. a matter of prioritization of the budget. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, Republicans find unlimited dollars when it comes to funding the voucher program in our state or sending the National Guard to the southern border. Uh, my priorities, as I stated at the beginning, are education, public safety, and affordable housing. And when I'm writing the budget uh, as governor, those will be reflected uh, as priorities and, and funded. Yes, uh, speaking of funding, you mentioned earlier about tax breaks that have been given to millionaires. And I'm wondering if you're referring to the interest and dividend uh, tax uh, sunsetting. Is, is, is that one of the things you're talking about? Should that be reinstituted? That is something that I will look into. As I mentioned, it's $160 million that's leaving the state uh, for you know the most wealthy when we need to be focused on, and as governor, I will be focused on decreasing costs for hardworking families in our state. Something you'd look into and, and consider doing? Correct. Um, finally, would you change anything about the state's redistricting process? <laughs> yes. I would put forward an independent redistricting uh, commission. Uh, we need to make sure that voters in our state are selecting our elected officials, not the other way around. You know, rights to voting are so critical. And we are seeing right now, again, Republicans put barriers in place uh, for people registering to vote, and that's wrong. We need to be doing everything that we can to encourage eligible voters to vote. In Manchester as mayor, uh, we've moved forward with updating our um, very dated and old voting infrastructure, investing in electronic voting so that we pretty much took away uh, the long lines for people uh, who were coming in to vote. We, uh, we um, translated uh, information on voting uh, so people understood who was on the ballot and when the elections were. And we provided free public transportation on primary and general election day uh, to, again, uh, decrease barriers for individuals who are voting. And I think that, you know, quite honestly, our state needs to take a step forward and look at automatic voting registration and um, no excuse absentee ballot, uh, absentee voting uh, in the state of New Hampshire. And those are things that I would look into. Joyce, you, you obviously a lot of your uh, experience 
in terms of public service has been in the largest city in the state. Um, but now you're you're running for governor. I'm sure you've been all over the state. What have you found um, in terms of differences in in traveling around to smaller communities uh, that might surprise you coming from Manchester? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a fourth generation resident of this state and, uh, you know, was raised in Manchester, but certainly have spent a lot of time in our state. Uh, and especially running for governor. And I'm running for governor to strengthen our local communities and ensure that residents across our state have the opportunity to succeed. As I'm traveling around the state and going to smaller towns, I am hearing uh, directly from them on uh, some issues that are specific, uh, broadband, um, access to public transportation, access to uh, health care. Uh, but I'm also hearing that the, ch the, the main challenges that we're facing are, are the same. Uh, access to quality public education, uh, reproductive health care, uh, you know, um, making sure that we are investing in renewable energy and climate change and investing in infrastructure that withholds that can withhold the storms that we're seeing that are coming more frequently and quality affordable housing. So the experience that I have as mayor tackling our statewide challenges and bringing results to uh, residents of Manchester translates well throughout our entire state because whether it's a city or a town, you know, we, we are dealing with challenges. And I have the experience of diagnosing challenges, bringing people together, uh, communicating to our community and bringing results uh, to our local communities. And, and that's what I intend to do as governor. Okay. Well, I, I, I think we're we're about out of questions. Uh, is there anything else that you, you'd like to say um, uh, while you have the time? Sure, you know, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you and uh, to answer your thoughtful questions. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity in the state of New Hampshire right now uh, to change the governor's office and to change uh, what's happening in our state and really take a hands-on approach to tackling our state's most pressing issues uh, when it comes to education, when it comes to housing, when it comes to decreasing costs for our families and building more affordable housing. And as mayor of Manchester, I have the hands-on experience of tackling these statewide challenges and getting results. And that's exactly what I wanna do for residents across our state. Make sure we have a governor who understands what's happening at the local level, who partners with our local communities uh, to bring positive results to residents across our state. So again, I wanna thank you and I hope to earn your support.